everyone. Welcome to this ASCO GU virtual roundtable. My name is Brian Reaney, and I'm a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. And I appreciate uh, being joined today by several experts in the field, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and we will start with Dr. Plimack. Hi, I'm Betsy Plimack. I'm a GU medical oncologist at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And Dr. McDermott. Uh, David McDermott. I'm a medical oncologist here in Boston at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Boss. Yeah. Hi, Martin Boss. I'm a geomedical oncologist also, and I practice at Memorial Sloan Center and Cancer Center in New York. Great. I appreciate you all joining us, and you all have extensive expertise in kidney cancer and drug development, so it should be a fun discussion. We're going to touch on several areas in um, the landscape of kidney cancer, incorporating some of the data uh, that was presented uh, just recently at ASCO GU in San Francisco. And we'll start with frontline clear cell kidney cancer. We'll talk then about non-clear cell. We'll cover some of the um, other major updates, including the adjuvant setting, and then probably end with, you know, sort of what you're most excited about, you know, as we head into the future and, and to the main ASCO meeting. Any other exciting data at ASCO, sub-Q Nebo, any of the rapid orals that caught your attention in kidney cancer? Martin, we'll start with you. Or, or if, if nothing, then maybe what's the biggest, you know, uh, either data set or concept that you're thinking about moving forward, say, in the next six to 12 months that you think might impact clinical care? Yeah, I do think, I mean, we, again, you know, we saw updated data on BiteSpark 05. So the quality of life data, I think, again, is in, in keeping with what's been reported before. It's nice to see more details and re reaffirm that you know, that's a very tolerable regimen. And I think that makes me excited about the various belzutifan based combinations coming out, both in pre-treated patients, there's a phase three that's fully accrued with a combination compared to single agent cabo, and then up front, the O12 study, which is also fully accrued. And, you know, we'll, with that readout at some point that looks into triplet therapy with now, um, you know, with a more tolerable oral agent than, you know, what we saw on, on Cosmic. So, I think that's what I'm uh, most excited about in terms of big things coming. Sounds good. Betsy, what do you think? Yeah, I think, again, you know, I love the long-term follow-up. I think the devil's in the details and we should continue to seek those. I would love to see, as mentioned, treatment-free survival data for the TKI-IO combos. But first, we have to have the courage to stop the TKI, either within the study or outside. Um, and I'm not sure enough people do for us to really get at that answer and I also remain excited about Belzutifan. I think the phase three, while positive, we were thought the Delta would be a little bit better compared to Everolimus. There are reasons for that you don't have to go into, but yeah, where is that best positioned? It's so well tolerated. It can lead to durable long-term responses. Who are those patients and, and what sorts of combinations do we need to prove that? And then let's learn going forward from what we didn't do in the older studies, which is let's have the courage to stop treatment in deep responders and see and measure what happens. Great. David, final word on this. So I agree with my colleagues. I'm all for more treatment-free survival research that Betsy wants us to do because it measures both the good and the durable bad of IOTOX, which certainly is real. I think building on what they said about HIF inhibition, it is easier to take than many of our old therapies. I think if you had compared quality of life of Belzutifan versus a VEGF TKI, you would have seen even bigger differences. As Betsy said, those differences with Everolimus were real, but not awesome. I think it would be a bigger difference if you were comparing it to some of the TKIs we use. But that just says we should try to move HIF inhibition up more as a single agent, which, you know, Martin mentioned some of those trials, which are interested in, in combination and, you know, could change standard of care. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to treat some patients with single agent HIF earlier in their course, as opposed to third and fourth line. And, you know, maybe we can do that with selection. Maybe we can do that with these other HIF inhibitors that are in clinical testing that, you know, we should be able to see more data on in the next year or two. Yeah, and I would just add, I agree with all of that. I mean, what what we really wanted to see, and I don't know that I saw much at ASCO GU, was just novel mechanisms, right? It's HIF slash VEGF and it's IO, which is great. And we've talked about it, you know, for 45 minutes, but truly novel, different mechanisms, you know, metabolic pathways, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever that might be. And in walking around the posters I saw, I didn't see a lot of that unless I missed something. So I think we, we all, there's definitely a subset of patients who's not responding to either and sort of blows through either. And, and we really need to understand that biology and, and have, you know, druggable targets. And I'm not sure we're quite there. 
Right. As we move all these therapies up, we, you get to the end of the line of therapy <laughs> sooner. So we need <laughs> novel therapies, that's for sure. So um, just want to thank Drs. Pumak, McDermott, and Voss. It was a great conversation. Uh, lots more to talk about and appreciate everyone joining us for this uh, Ask a GU virtual roundtable. <laughs>